Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Robin Stafford, and I am with the Office of Engagement at UVA. I am pleased to welcome Katie Swenson and Elgin Cleckley. In full disclosure, Katie is my dear friend and former Charlottesville neighbor. She is now a senior principal at Mass Design Group in Boston. But when I first met her in the early 2000s, she was an Enterprise Rose Fellow working on the Piedmont Housing Alliance's 10th and Page Street neighborhood revitalization project in Charlottesville. She was responsible for the design and construction of 30 affordable homes in the neighborhood between the university and downtown. These were also notable for being the first affordable houses in the Earthcraft Home Program for Virginia. Katie's book, Design with Love, At Home in America, documents 20 years of stories and projects from numerous Rose Fellows. We're pleased to have this conversation about developing sustainable and affordable communities in the United States in light of her book being published this week. <clears throat> Katie is joined tonight by Professor Elgin Cleckley of the Architecture School. In addition to teaching, he is a designer, director, and principal of the firm Empathic Design. He is also a recent recipient of the Dumbarton Oaks Mellon Fellowship in Urban Landscape Studies. I will now turn this over to Katie and then Elgin for conversation. Feel free to enter any questions you may have in the Q&A and we will get to as many as possible. We're also going to drop a link to the UVA bookstore in the chat if you'd like to purchase the book. A percentage of bookstore sales support UVA programs such as Access UVA. Thank you and enjoy the program. Hi there. Hello everyone, thank you very much. I'm happy to introduce Katie this evening and thank you all for attending. We all know the feeling when you meet someone and their effect on you is tremendous. They affect you so much that memories of your interactions shift you, how you think and what you think. Everything seems brighter because of them as they emit light. That's what it felt like the first time I met Katie Swinson. That's also what it feels like every time I speak with her as well. I'm very honored to introduce Katie this evening, first as an admirer, fellow alum and foremost friend. Katie Swinson is a nationally recognized design leader, researcher, writer, and educator, a senior principal at Mass Design Group, an international design collective whose mission is to research, build, and advocate for architecture that promotes justice and human dignity. Katie was previously the vice president of design and sustainability at Enterprise Community Partners, Inc., an expert in affordable housing, community development, and leadership cultivation. Katie founded Enterprises National Design Initiative, directing the Affordable Housing Design Leadership Institute, the Pre-Development Design Grant, and the Rose Fellowship, which we'll learn about this evening. The Rose Fellowship partners emerging architectural designers and cultural practitioners with local community development organizations to facilitate an inclusive approach to development resulting in sustainable and affordable communities. The Enterprise Rose Fellowship work has been showcased at the Museum of Modern Art, Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, the New York Center for Architecture, the National Building Museum, and recognized by the AIA for its groundbreaking work. Katie was a Harvard University Graduate School of Design Loeb Fellow in 2018 and 2019, also teaching at the Boston Architectural College and Parsons School of Design at the New School lecturing extensively on sustainable community development and affordable housing. She holds a bachelor's degree in comparative literature from the University of California, Berkeley, and a master's degree in architecture from the University of Virginia. Here in Charlottesville, Kitty was a fellow, a Rose Fellow with the Piedmont Housing from 2001 to 2004, and with collaborators opened the Charlottesville Community Design Center, applying a community-led approach with neighborhoods across the city. We still look forward to her sharing Design with Love with us this evening, her new book documenting partnerships and innovations in design across the US, led by some of the most talented young architects, planners, and social entrepreneurship professionals. We thank you for this time this evening, Katie, and the gifts of your experience. Thank you so much for that 
beautiful, warm introduction, Elgin. And um, Robin, thanks so much for galvanizing us together tonight. It's such a treat for me to uh, be with the UVA community so early in this journey of uh, Design with Love coming out. My experience in Charlottesville and UVA is in many ways where my love of architecture really took hold and um, I started out on this incredible path that I'm going to share with you tonight. Um, so I'm so glad to be here. I'm going to start, I'm going to share my screen. This is a highly visual presentation. Um, so I'm going to complement my talk with images. So, um, I, you know, I have a few more thank yous to say before I get started. And this is really to both Jonathan Rose and Enterprise Community Partners, who 20 years ago shared a vision that communities could build more lasting and beautiful, sustainable housing if architects and developers worked in partnership. I also want to thank all of the Rose Fellows over these last 20 years. We're going to talk about a few of them tonight, but I could tell these same stories about all 90 plus fellows. Together, they've really charted a new path about how designers and community developers can work collaboratively to address the deep issues that are facing our communities today. These seemingly intractable, I would say, issues of poverty, institutionalized racism, disenfranchisement and neglect and abandonment of neighborhoods. So as we talk about Design with Love, I'm gonna share this book, which gives a window into 10 of the Rose Fellowship communities. I hope I'll give you a little bite-sized piece and you'll um, get the book and share it yourselves. In anticipation of the Rose Fellowship's 20th anniversary, photographer Harry Connolly and I embarked on a two-year journey to visit and revisit Rose Fellows all over the country. The result is this book, which captures best practices and hard, hard won wisdom. I first met Harry when I was a Rose Fellow in 2005, and he has now met and photographed every fellow in the program, along with hundreds of community members. Harry is as much a storyteller as a visual artist, and the subjects of his photo photos are often people whose stories remain usually untold. This book is a sort of visual homage to the communities representing here. The writing in this book reflects my personal perspective, and I have tried to represent each person's experience and aspirations authentically. I would also say in doing so, I've become increasingly aware of the problematic nature of telling other people's stories through my lens as a white person who has never known discrimination, housing insecurity, or economic hardship. I could not have done so without the generous cooperation and support of each person featured in Design with Love, who really welcomed us into their communities, spent many hours with us, and participated in the telling and editing of their stories. So what is the Rose Fellowship? Launched in 2000, the fellowship is a three-year partnership between Enterprise Community Partners, the fellow, and a host organization. Enterprise recruits hosts and candidates and provides the curriculum and support and funding for the program. Community partners apply to host a fellow, detailing their aspirations for organizational ambitions and a work plan. The fellowship provides the time and resources for the fellows to become immersed in a community. The goal is to give the fellows a chance to get to know the people and understand their unique circumstances and needs. After learning from the local community and developing trusting relationships, these fellows contribute their design skills to help create sustainable, equitable, connected communities for people of all income levels. In short, the fellowship is a platform for social justice designers to learn how to become community architects. Across the nation, 19 million families, about one in six, face housing insecurity. Most of the communities in which the fellows have worked have been communities of color. I remember working at Rosie's Place, a shelter for women in Boston in the mid 1980s. What I didn't know as my high school self, was that homelessness was reaching a peak with over 2 million people 
experiencing homelessness every year, and that that has seemingly, shockingly, become a fact of our society. Most of the host organizations are com community development corporations, typically not-for-profit inc incorporated to provide programs to serve geographic locations, such as neighborhoods or towns, usually focusing on lower income residents or struggling neighborhoods. CDCs work to advance economic development, education, community organizing, and real estate development. These organizations also are some of the main drivers of affordable housing in this country. This book is called Design with Love because love is the best way to describe the approach that community leaders we have met take in working with their neighbors to strive for what Martin Luther King called the beloved community, a world in which hunger, homelessness, and poverty will not be tolerated. Through our travels, it became increasingly clear that the most successful communities and fellows were those that share the same core elements, clear commitment to their mission, a common understanding of the philosophical and spiritual underpinnings of their work, and the tenacity to meet their community's goals. Love is here expressed also through direct service. This means the work of design, but also the work of listening, valuing a variety of perspectives and building trusting relationships. It recognizes that residents themselves are experts in understanding their own needs, aspirations, and solutions. Love is a crucial tool for design as a problem solving. Love is as crucial a tool for, uh, as, sorry, love is as crucial a tool of design for problem solving as meeting a pro forma or getting a building permit. The foundation for collaborative design is based on a two way long term community relationship increasingly exponentially both the number of problems that can be solved and the number of people who can benefit. I was a Rose Fellow, as Robin mentioned, here in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, I started and I graduated from with my master's in architecture in 2001, uh, 2000, and as I was graduating, there was an advertisement from enterprise community partners having a call for something called a community architect. I had never heard those words before, but something in me immediately lit up. Whatever a community architect was, that's what I wanted to be. I partnered with Piedmont Housing here in Charlottesville. As with all Rose Fellows, I stepped into a community development initiative that was already underway. My primary project was the 10th and Page Street Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative. My role was to participate in the project management and funding while designing and overseeing the rehabilitation and new construction of 31 homes, about 10% of the neighborhood, for mixed income home ownership. I also worked with Hope, Hope Community Center to rehab and build a new rec center for the neighborhood and later open the Charlottesville Community Design Center. Two of the stories that I tell in Design with Love um, are sort of bookends. The first one takes place in San Isidro, California, where we'll meet David Flores, who was a Rose Fellow um, at the same time in my tenure from 2001 to 2004, and still lives and works in this community. San Isidro, as many of you know, is on the border of Tijuana. It's the largest land port, um, most used land port in the country. Um, David Flores is a remarkable young architect. Um, he started, he moved to San Isidro in 2000 and started partnering with Casa Familiar, an organization that has been serving residents of San Isidro for over 50 years. As many of us are become increasingly aware, the situation at the border is only becoming increasingly intense. San Isidro is a small town that has to kind of assume so much of the border um, life. David has a particular uh, vantage point, I would say, as um, someone who was born in Mexico and came with his family over to the US when he was nine years old. Later, when his father, when he was 19 and his father was arrested, incarcerated, and deported, his family was severed. 
And I think David has worked his entire life to understand that families, as he says, are not governed by borders, they are governed by love. His first project was this project, the Casitas. I love the bold, bright colors, and David talks about how color itself is a way to kind of reflect culture and connect people um, with their homeland. Along with affordable housing development, David worked on um, building a new kind of design center. In fact, for those Charlottesville folks, it was modeled in part after the Charlottesville Community Design Center, a collaborative of art and design called The Front. Um, he's also worked on projects all over the city. The important thing to understand about place-based work is that no issue is really necessarily off the table. Affordable housing is a great need in San Isidro, but of course, residents also need all of the other amenities. And Casa Familiar works on libraries and new parks and variety of programs. Through his leadership here, David also joined the Planning Commission of San Isidro. He understood that these larger issues affecting the community could not only be solved by development itself. Um, David started to understand how all of this experience of the border for families in San Isidro could both challenge life dramatically and also could be made better. This picture was taken two years ago. There's a new port, um, the San Isidro land port was at that time still under construction. It's one of the largest infrastructure projects we have in the country. For those of you who are curious about walls and borders, um, please rest assured that there already are walls and many borders. I was sort of shocked to find that the concertina was needed to be added even after much of the design and infrastructure work was already taking place. The border has become increasingly difficult to cross and cars line up to San Isidro. So once one of the projects that David has taken on is an air uh, quality um, study with uh, San Diego State and the University of Washington. He's also been working at the border itself, trying to humanize the experience of crossing as so many people do every day. One of his victories as a member of um, the Planning Commission and advisor to the land port was actually advocating for a second pedestrian entrance with 30,000 pedestrians crossing each way every day. There had only been the plan for one pedestrian entrance, the east at the East facility, and now there are two. He also participated in an art program sponsored for the border control. Um, with his wife, who is now executive director of Casa Familiar, um, they've continued in uh, serving the community of, of San Isidro, and um, we're very excited to open just recently in January Another, um, another affordable housing project called Living Rooms at the Border, designed by Teddy Cruz. Um, but the problems of affordability are extremely complicated in a community like this, where the area median income is quite low. But um, like issues in Charlottesville, where the general area is actually quite wealthy, as in San Diego, it's very difficult to reach the degree of affordability that's really necessary to serve the uh, family members of San Isidro. I'm gonna turn next to Baltimore, which is the last project that we talk about in the book. Baltimore was a special project for us in many ways. Um, our Rose Fellow there, uh, da um, Daniel Greenspan, um, has just finished his Rose Fellowship. So while David has been working in San Isidro for 20 years, this was about a two year story. It's also where Harry Connolly lives. So we got a, an extra sort of front row seat. For many of you who know Baltimore, um, you know that it's a community that experienced some of the worst of racist um, race-based policies where many communities across the country, 239 communities had been redlined in the 1930s, Baltimore actually got kind of a leg up on a race-based planning strategy in the 1910s. The result of this um, is 
you know, a, 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 an incredible lack of investment in so many neighborhoods all over Baltimore. On one special block on West Saratoga Street uh, between Fulton and Monroe, um, a community member sort of got up in, uh, decided he wanted to really fight back against this kind of rampant disinvestment. On this street, out of 42 homes, which includes the corner lots, there were only eight owner-occupied houses. Seven houses have been demolished because of blight, and 12 were in imminent danger of being torn down. So meet Donald Quarles, who is a resident of uh, West Saratoga Street. He's lived in this neighborhood since his family moved to Baltimore when he was eight years old. His initial goal looking at the neighbor, looking at the demolition of the buildings across the street was actually in many ways quite simple. He wanted to stop the dumping on the lots across the street. But over time, he started to increase his ambitions. And when he met a Rose Fellow, um, Daniel, they started to partner in dreaming about the idea that these formerly um, abandoned houses, now vacant lots, could actually serve the, the neighborhood in a larger way. The role of a Rose Fellow is an interesting one. The fellows are trained as architects and artists. They're trained in, some of them, in landscape architecture and community processes. But I think Daniel's statement is also important for all of these fellows. A lot of my work is simply about helping people have a voice and power in a city that isn't well situated to help them building the capacity of community members to have the ability to sit at a table when people are making decisions and navigate it to what they want. So Donald and Daniel and the Franklin Square Neighborhood Association got to work cleaning up what we now call Kirby Lane Park. In order to make it a safe space for children, they had to start by making it a safe space for elders. And horseshoes is the, one of the main games in the neighborhood. So they started by building a horseshoe pit, recruiting some of the um, elder men in the neighborhood to come out and take ownership of this park. The project expanded and more and more people got involved. Eventually, a corporation donated playground equipment and many others throughout the city got involved. The real dream of Donald from the very beginning was to build what he called a serenity park. Um, it's certainly a place for grown-ups to play and recreate, a place for children to play and recreate, but above all it needed to be a place of peace. And the last part of this um, adventure for Donald was the creation of this beautiful mural um, that just got finished last April. I think the Rose Fellowship is a way to rethink a little bit about our career paths and understanding how the professions that we choose have larger implications. I know for me as an architect, I came into architecture because I wanted to um, make an impact in people's lives. And understanding how to do that was not necessarily evident from the beginning. But through all these lessons, examples, the trips and conversations, I have gotten to know the tenacity and beauty of community members who they themselves are every day fighting against systemic conditions that they did not create, but are determined to change. I'm so inspired by them and committed that we must do better not only to assist them in their local efforts, but to change the underlying conditions that require their struggle. Love, too, may be the only powerful force that's powerful enough to undermine and delegitimize the widespread systemic forces that make community development necessary in the first place. We know that without a stable home, everything else falls apart. What will it take for us to create a national housing policy that commits to the fundamental right of each person to have a high quality home? I hope this book will give you an appreciation for the results of the Rose Fellows and their partners, for the diversity and beauty of the communities 
that have welcomed them. And I hope it will inspire you to get to work wherever you are to join the legions of committed designers, developers, community organizers, and neighbors fighting to bring justice home. Thank you. Inspiring indeed. Thank you, Katie. I'm sure right now everyone is giving you virtual claps at the top of the court. I can't see them, but uh, that's the new, the new way of giving claps. But thank you very much. I clap for you. Thank you. Our Zoom, our Zoom reality. So <laughs> exactly. thank you everyone exactly. for being here. Just to let everyone know, if you have further questions, please add them to the Q&A. I have a list of all the questions that I'll integrate in our conversation as well. But one thing, Katie, I wanted to start with is the idea of just the energy I had when I was reading the book. I felt like I was traveling along and it was this incredible solve, it gave me lots of comfort. And I realized in that is that it made me really reflect on this year and where we are thinking about the social and spatial justice movement. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about where we are now in reference to your work. I just feel like there's a really great moment there for you to speak about. You know, in some ways, um, this book project um, took hold in my mind in 2016, around just around this time of year. It was interesting, I was um, meeting the Rose Fellows out in the Bay Area. We as a group, the Active Fellows, get together a couple times a year to learn from each other. And um, so we had probably about 16, 15, 16 Fellows touring San Jose, Oakland, and San Francisco. And on the last day was a, a sort of a exhausting trip in many ways, so full and so much to see. And on the last day, a kind of argument broke out. And it was really surprising to me because, you know, usually for the fellows, the work is really difficult, but they rely on each other for this kind of fellowship. But the debate that broke, broke out is around, um, rural versus urban. And the rural fellows were making the point that people were living and working in big cities really didn't understand rural America. And this kind of idea that we live in a red state, blue state, or rural urban, or white black, or Republican Democrat, the idea that what we see in the virtual space um, on television or on Twitter becomes the way we see America. When the election results came to bear a few weeks later, I thought in many ways that the fellows were sort of like canaries in a coal mine in a sense, because they have their feet on the ground in communities every day. So the struggles and the reality are not a surprise to them. You know, I finished this book in um, the last, uh, I guess, text was done in January before COVID broke out before um, the Black Lives Matter movement has taken on such incredible force. Um, but I think that the stories and the realities that are described and shared in this book are not based on public opinion. They're based on human experience and the very real stories of very real people. So issues of systemic racism were not a surprise um, to these people. Issues around um, housing injustice are in no way a surprise. So I'm glad, I mean, of course, I'm so glad to see the world shifting and the world coming to recognize that we have in fact designed our cities the way they are. The disinvestment has been intentional or it maybe most recently just not faced. So we have some real decisions to make, I think right now about how willing we're gonna to be to step up and create the kind of built environment that reflects our values. Thank you so much. Maybe a place to start with, with that is that places to step up, which is happening now in education. It's a great question here from Lynette DeLong. By the way, I apologize to anyone who mispronou I mispronounce your name. It happens to me often. Uh, do you have any advice for young people looking at careers in urban and sustainable design and architecture? Absolutely. I would say number one, we need you. 
So come on, come on over. Um, we need a lot of hands on deck here and we need great talent to be working in this space. There's so many issues to be solved. Um, last week at the School of Architecture, I was able to be part of a um, presentation that my colleagues and I at Mass Design Group was able to give to um, members of the school. And um, Christian Benimana, who led that event for us, made, a, made reference to a mantra that is used at the African Leadership University, whose campus we're designing in Kigali, Rwanda. And the, um, the, the message was to students, um, declare your mission, not your major. And that advice really stuck with me. And I found myself using it this morning with a young woman who graduated last year from architecture school and was looking about how to start out on her career path. There's so much that one needs to learn to be competent, experienced, and successful in this industry. You have to learn how to design. You have to learn how to build. But you also have to learn all these other bigger skills like empathy and listening and community facilitation. So what I said to her is really, don't worry about the job yet. Worry about your mission. Worry about your personal mission. And make sure that you use whatever job that you secure in the meanwhile as a strategy to build your tool set. So I loved that idea to um, declare your mission rather than maybe even your profession. It's a great place to start. And you really get that feeling as you go through the book. You get that throughout the text, following the beloved community. But you also feel it in the photographs where you feel like you're actually obtaining the skills or being open to the skills as you journey through. And while I was reading it, I made a list of the toolbox to the toolkit. I love clearly, but humility, listening, collaboration, the revolution of caring that came up with Daniel Greenspan was speaking of, co-creation, openness, empathy. It's really powerful to think about that, that your mission is here and then what's in your toolkit that you want to discover and also evolve with. Another question here, uh, how can architects, we'll pivot a bit, how can architects learn to conceptualize embodied and life cycle related energy flows rather than just operational energy? That's Nicholas Lee, Engineering 2016. Yeah, so um, Robin mentioned that after nearly 20 years with Enterprise, I um, made a wonderful transition to work with Mass Design Group, which is, I'm based in Boston, but we have offices in Kigali, Rwanda and around the world. And one of the main, um, one of the many things that we're working on is understanding sustainability and green building more from an understanding of holistic health and carbon, um, you know, carbon reduction, essentially. So I think that much of the kind of green building techniques that we certainly learned in, in my early days of green building were about sealing up buildings and um, lowering the load um, necessarily of the energy load. But we're learning now, I think, that our buildings need to do so much more for us. All of us are expecting a lot more of our homes. We're expecting them to keep us healthy too, to be able to, um, to breathe and to think about design in a way that I think is much more sort of in tune with the environment. But I also think it's incredibly important that as architects and everyone in the associated industries, that we really look at the embodied carbon of our work as much as the sort of building performance, because we've invested a lot in developing materials which have a lot of downstream consequences. There's another question here from Stella Tarnay. Uh, works in the biophilic space, bringing nature experience to urban residents through capitalnature.org. And she asks, what do you think is the role of architects to work with landscape architects and naturalists to bring loving, healing spaces to urban residents, especially during a pandemic? 
Oh gosh, I love that question. Um, you know, it was so exciting time for me to be at University of Virginia. Um, I was I was in the architecture school from 96 to 2000, 90, 96 to 2000. And it was a time when the Department of Landscape Architecture and the Department of Architecture were starting to um, really partner in more integrated ways. In fact, uh, I think there were some of the first dual degree students who were able to, in four years, get both degrees. Um, and that was a fantastic foundation for me. And what I've discovered over time is that um, landscape architecture is, uh, is, is really has been incredibly under, under present, um, not present in the affordable housing space. So one of the goals that we worked on at Enterprise through, especially through a program called the Affordable Housing Design Leadership Institute was um, trying to help developers become design leaders and for them to understand that landscape architects were critical to the early forming of a project, not something that you, you know, you bring it in at the end to kind of shrub it up, but rather bringing an awareness and the skills and talents of landscape architecture and the perspective in to all affordable housing development. I think that one of the reasons though that I focused tonight on Baltimore and that that project among so many made it into um, the book is that, you know, in some ways, Kirby Lane Park took two years and cost about uh, $200,000. And it serves the entire neighborhood. So I would say that that's, you know, less than the cost of one unit of new housing. And it also has kind of catalyzed this sort of sense of can-do optimism in the neighborhood. Donald Carls has become kind of a neighborhood legend and people go to him and say, how did you do it? And can you help and share with me? Um, and I have a lot on my block that needs this kind of revitalization. So I hope that this um, pandemic time, which has had so many horrible consequences will also have some really grounding, you know, grounding learnings for us. You know, I guess, the, you know, amongst the many, two key are how important home is to us. Where would we be right now without our homes? And how can we kind of recenter ourselves in the absolute need for home? for everybody. And then the other is that in addition to your home, you need beauty, you need green space, you need a healthy environment. And, um, you know, in so many ways, so many of the other things that we thought we needed, offices and shopping malls, it turns out maybe we need a little bit less of, um, but that those two things are essential really to our spirit and our soul, as well as our productivity and um, our families' lives. A lot of questions here, it's just great. Thank you, everyone. So from Michael Orlansky, can you point to a design project that was noteworthy in addressing the concerns of people with disabilities and facilitating their mean, meaningful inclusion in the community? Yeah, is it Michael? <laughs> Did Michael ask that question? That's right. That's yeah, you know, Michael, I I have to say I don't think that um, that that question is adequately addressed in Design with Love. I think that's um, I think that's something that is is definitely left out. So I'm sorry to report that. Um, I think that some of the you know, work that has been most influential in this space is the design of senior housing um, where, you know, an emphasis is put on both um, accessibility for people with disabilities and a kind of understanding about how a, a building needs to be designed to sort of meet people where they're at, but also give them the opportunities um, to, you know, 
like fully engage in the environment. So um, that's not represented in Design with Love. And I think it's also probably underrepresented in some of, um, some of the larger work that's really needed. So I'd love, love to hear about your thoughts on that and, and, and following up on that. There's a question here from Finn Moran. Are there tactics for avo avoiding displacement gentrification when designing affordable housing or making community improvements? Yeah, I think, you know, it's, um, I think that's so much at, you know, it's been at sort of the core of, I think, some of the concern is that as soon as neighborhoods become nice, um, that means that they're in this kind of financial transition um, and that the people who have lived there are going to need to move out. I showed a few pictures um, today of the International District in Seattle where Joanne Ware um, worked with interim CDA. And, you know, the development pressure in Seattle, as you may know, is just kind of on fire. And the International District is very close to downtown. And so there are also a lot of um, small brick buildings that have seismic issues. So there was a time in Seattle where because of the race-based zoning there, um, Asian Pacific Islanders were not really allowed to live in communities outside of the international district or not allowed and by that I mean they couldn't necessarily there was they couldn't necessarily get a loan or there was a sort of um, a kind of discriminatory policy so now we get to the point where that area is hot and um, you know where it's always been a place where new Asian Pacific Islanders have kind of started their lives and then continued to return for the cultural um, depth of that neighborhood, they're getting kicked out. So we're seeing this kind of thing all over the country and I wish I had a magic solution for it. But I do think that, um, you know, some of the projects in the book, um, which are, you know, in the Mississippi Delta, in neighborhoods of Detroit, on tribal lands, neighborhoods of Baltimore, I guess in some ways, these are areas that are not necessarily ripe for gentrification. And community members are digging in deep to uphold the kind of community and cultural values and make uh, community improvements for their neighbors, not for a development, uh, long-term development plan. I think it's probably also the reason that I have chosen in my career to partner with community development corporations. Um, community development corporations, nonprofits that have a mission to, you know, really serve their residents, serve the residents of their neighborhoods. And, um, you know, there are thousands of these groups around the country, but they're often small, they're often underfunded, they're often under a tremendous amount of pressure. And I think that we need to really bolster those efforts because um, the kind of development dollar is hard to uh, tamper with. So one of the strategies that we need to do is to lift up and um, empower and finance the work of community development corporations. Mm -hmm. The question here from Aaron Riley, Architecture 1990. Hi, Aaron. <laughs> Do you want to get involved in bringing more affordable housing to towns like Wellesley? How best to go about overcoming the fear of affordable housing in traditionally wealthy communities? Yeah, um, Aaron. You know, I think. You know, I guess I'll 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 look forward to you know, having a more robust conversation about this, I think that the idea that affordable housing is um, so kind of feared or stigmatized is at the core of what some of the message 
that design with love is trying to express. Um, you know, affordable housing has had kind of a stigma attached to it. I think it's really important to recognize that in the United States, less than 5% of all housing is subsidized affordable housing. So if you go to, you know, Europe or other places, you know, between 20 and 80% of all housing is some form of social housing. Countries take on an idea that they're gonna provide housing option for all people in their society. And in the US, if you put together all of the public housing, all of the um, affordable housing that's funded by programs like the low income housing tax credit, and even housing vouchers, Section 8 housing vouchers, that only accounts for 5% of all the housing. And I'm sure this is an educated audience. We know the poverty statistics in America, and we also know that people of middle incomes are having a terrible time affording housing. So I think that we need to really take a step back and kind of you know, I guess I use the word love um, on purpose, you know, start to step back and recognize the humanity of each other and recognize that, you know, we share in more things than things that separate us. And one of those absolute fundamental things is, you know, a beautiful high quality home that, and a place to raise our families. So, I'd like to think that we can get ourselves out of the mindset around real estate as a commodity and worrying about, you know, our taxes and, you know, all of the kind of, you know, real estate prices and actually focus on the fact that as a country, we need to make sure that everyone has a home. I think I mentioned, um, earlier that, you know, I grew up in, in Wellesley in the Boston area and um, working at a homeless shelter in Boston when I was in 11th grade and 12th grade, I got to sort of have this firsthand experience of living in a community like Wellesley where I had a wonderful home and a wonderful community. And I was meeting people who had some, were on this kind of slippery slope where as soon as they lose their house, it is very difficult for anything else positive to happen in their lives. And the thing that I think shocks me now is that while in the mid 80s, this kind of rampant homelessness was actually kind of not maybe new, but you know, we didn't see homelessness like we started to experience then. But since that time, those numbers have stayed pretty static or gone up. And now I think, you know, certainly in New York, Seattle, Los Angeles, um, San Francisco, but all across America, certainly here in Boston, we've kind of come to accept that, I guess, um, you know, 550,000 people on any given night are gonna sleep outside or um, two and a half million people any given year will experience homelessness. So I think there's something that we need to sort of challenge ourselves on that and do a gut check and say, is that okay? And start with a kind of um, get out of maybe even using the word housing and use the word home and change our minds about these issues and, um, and start to bring these issues into our own neighborhoods and homes wherever wherever they are. It's great. It's a great question. A few more minutes that we have left. Just a couple questions from Eric Einhorn. Hi, Eric. Katie, how have you seen the heavier role of analytics and data now plays an efficient, effective, and evocative design impact decisions for community-based design? Is there a role for data-driven design and are there key metrics you look at in your work? Mm. Yeah, I, um, well, I guess I'm gonna answer that question in a couple ways. I mean, I think we spoke earlier about 
issues around um, carbon. And I think that some of the metrics, really important metrics that are being developed are around like, what is the impact of our building field and um, what are the impacts that it's having on the environment as well as, you know, all the going all through the value chain. Um, I think the metrics that I have come to rely on the most are the ambitions that community members have at the outset of a project. So I think the most important metric in the community-based work or maybe in any work is does the ultimate outcome live up to the ambitions of the project and how do you know that? And so I think the Rose Fellows go through a really important process with community members. We've talked a lot about listening tonight and what is the role of listening? You know, the first role of listening and the role of a designer listening is to be able to kind of um, tease out and, um, and lift up community voices and ideas and goals and aspirations. And, turn them into a real kind of mission statement for a project. And the design of any building or project should then be uh, a reflection on that initial you know, goal. Are you meeting those initial design goals? And can you then commit to measuring your success as it's done for two reasons? You know, one, if you hadn't lived up to the project's goals, how do you uh, pause or stop and change things so that they become what they need to be? And, um, and in order to kind of build more capacity in the field to have confidence around um, getting, you know, having larger aspirations and understanding that we can both design our way towards those aspirations together and then hold ourselves and each other up as a community to evaluate our success. Question here from Nicholas Lee. Are there current examples of participatory design involving the community and the planning and design process directly that you find particularly exciting? Um, gosh, so many. Um, just, this, just this last last week or the week before, um, the Association for Community Design had their annual conference and it was um, remote this year. Um, but I think what's been incredibly exciting coming out of the sort of public interest and community design world are a whole plethora of both kind of um, really enhanced tools for participation. Um, a lot of sharing and learning about success stories. I think that, you know, when I started out in this field in 2000, it was sort of a new field at the time. We didn't necessarily have these kind of um, mechanisms. And in many cases, we were, you know, making them up on our own and sort of sharing with each other as fellows um, but I think now there's um, a really pretty rigorous um, and impactful set of both um, processes. Many of the Rose Fellows have not only, you know, engaged in these, but they're all open, you know, they're published online, they're available. Um, but certainly it's not unique to Rose Fellows and the Association for Community Design Conference really showed the depth and breadth of community-based work across the country. It's a great entry into Sasha Paul's question. It gives some points. She's asking about, uh, she's excited to read and reflect on Design with Love, of course, but how can those who are still studying architecture in college start introducing community-based design into your studio work? Yeah, Sasha, I know you were um, on the call the other day and I so appreciate you reaching out to me too. I look forward to connecting one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I think there's a lot of debate right now about that question though. So I'm not sure, maybe Elgin is the one to answer this question for me. 
I think part of the debate that's happening in architecture schools is around um, how do you teach all of the sort of traditional forms around uh, design that you absolutely need to learn, but also um, incorporate contemporary um, attitudes towards um, who designs, what design is, who's designed for, how it happens, um, understanding history. When I was in school, I'm not sure I ever saw a redlining map. Um, when I was in school, we looked at different kinds of um, maps of a neighborhood. We'd certainly look at, you know, thanks to especially the kind of landscape program, we'd look at what watershed our neighborhood was in or what are the, what's the larger ecology of a neighborhood. We might look at the Sanborn historical maps that showed where buildings used to be. Um, but we didn't really have at that time an eye on um, redlining maps or the kind of um, the, all the factors that go into um, creating neighborhoods that some are deeply invested in and others are disinvested in. And um, often I think now, you know, there are lots of questions, should design studios work in poor communities? You know, is this something that we should be doing? Um, should we send students out to work with community members for a semester? Uh, the project that I show in Greenwood, Mississippi, our Rose Fellow, Emily Roush Elliott, arrived there about seven years ago to a neighborhood in Baptist Town uh, in, in Greenwood. And it was a neighborhood that was very heavily studied for I think 11 years, a couple of universities had traveled down to do um, analysis of the neighborhood. But no positive changes had resulted on the ground for community members. And, um, you know, the kind of block and tackle everyday work that it takes to be able to see a community plan come to fruition is not a semester long project. Um, so I think, you know, again, I'll, I'll leave it to Elgin and his very capable peers at UVA to help think about these things. And I'd love, you know, for students obviously to have their, ex their opinions and expertise in these questions as well. I think it's really important that we, um, that we understand our role as designers is um, you know there's a need for design everywhere um, most of our buildings and built landscape is not designed by architects there's a need for design everywhere so i i think that you know i guess what i would say is how do you develop the perspective the desire the empathy the history the knowledge um, a sense of the structural conditions of america or wherever you are working um, develop the kind of listening and, and empathetic skills that you can, but always know that to be a partner with a community takes dedication. Um, you know, and I think Daniel Greenspan certainly shows that in his two or three years, um, two years at the time, three years now, he formed an in tense and incredibly dedicated partnership with his community. But I think we also see the model of David Flores, who has been working for the benefit of the citizens of San Isidro for 20 years now and continues that work. So um, I think it's a long term prospect. And, uh, you know, the same about finding a career, you know, declare your mission, um, you know, not your major. So focus on your mission, your personal mission, guiding yourself and gathering skills and experiences so that, you know, if community-based work is what you wanna do, you're gonna get your chance when it's right and you can do it in the way that is most meaningful both for you and for the community. Maybe one more question as we're at time. Uh, 
it's Caroline Carr Grant. Hi, Caroline Carr. As an author and designer, where do you turn for inspiration? What are you reading or what media are you consuming that, that inspires you? Mm. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, wow. So, um, you know, it's it's been a funny time in the media, hasn't it? It's also about what you don't watch, I think. Um, so I think I've been um, I've been incredibly um, inspired. Uh, I've been incredibly inspired by so much of the really important and deep conversation that's been happening, of course, around um, memorials and memorialization in the U.S. Incredibly inspired by the conversation that is happening around issues of race and equity. I've also been, um, you know, inspired by, in many ways, some of the um, lessons that we're learning from the COVID time, um, ideas around um, being kind of in, in place with each other. Um, as an author, I, you know, for those of you who um, know Charlottesville, of course, I. I um, co-wrote a book with William Morris and Suzanne Schindler called Growing Urban Habitats that um, is set in the Belmont neighborhood of Charlottesville. Um, takes on a case at Sunrise Trailer Park, a community that was in, in, in um, was going to be demolished and instead was redeveloped in partnership with the residents. And um, I hadn't necessarily been writing since that time. Um, you know, I think the work of an architect and the work of writing is in many ways sort of um, co very complementary in that it's critical thinking and expression. But writing sort of took hold of me and, you know, this month is incredible because not only do I have Design with Love, which is a, you know, a 20 year journey for me coming out into um, coming out into the world. But I also three years ago started writing another book, which is coming out this month too, which is called In Bohemia, um, a memoir of love, loss and kindness, which is a more personal narrative, a very personal narrative. Um, it's a love story. It's a grief story. It's got some architecture and history woven through it. Um, I think in the end, both of these stories, one that springs from kind of my personal life and one that springs from my professional life are really both about love and home. And the writing has allowed me such an outlet of um, curiosity, creativity, a chance to, um, you know, in the case, in the personal case, a chance for me to confront uh, an overwhelming grief and be able to kind of navigate through that with a sense of peace and um, optimism. And from a professional standpoint, you know, also curiosity. I think writing about the Rose Fellowship allowed me to reflect on parts of my experience that I had been involved in, but not as reflective, reflexive on. Um, so I think I've been in a period where writing has been maybe more important lately to me than reading or consuming um, because it's been a profound time for me to kind of understand both where I am in the world and maybe where the world is for me. Thank you so much, Katie speak for everyone in saying how much we've learned from you and with you this evening and how thankful we are to think about our own personal mission and how we go forth working on ourselves with the beloved community. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank everybody. Thanks for great questions. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight too and thank you so much Elgin, Katie, for all your good work and it was a terrific conversation. So thank you. Um, Danielle is dropping the link again to the UVA bookstore for the book. It's a terrific place to get the book because it also supports UVA student programs. Anyway, take care, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And best of luck, Katie, with the book.
Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. So good to see you. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, Elgin. Thank you, everybody.